Good morning. This morning's theme is trusting God amidst the challenges of life. We're going to start our service with a reading of Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with triumphant sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's stand. Good morning, everyone. So uh, the image on the screen is one, as Natalie mentioned, by Tai Tab Rushnell. He is an Anishinaabe artist from Trenton, Ontario. We've shown some of his art in the past. Uh, this particular piece is called Indigenous Visions. And Nat said it reminds her of Weston Road. And I thought, me too. I grew up just down the street from here. I spent my time as a kid at Bala, and then CR Marchant, and then Weston Collegiate. I actually loved it in this neighborhood, despite some of the hardships. I would say that I had a pretty good childhood rolling up my jeans and walking through the Humber River. Dangerous, but didn't seem that way at the time. Playing knock on nine doors and really annoying one old Italian man that was always cursing at us in Italian. Uh, we also played hide and seek in Scott's funeral home, pretty wild, when we should have been at youth group across the street at Mount Dennis Baptist Church. I also remember punching Troy Downey in the shoulder for almost stepping on my brand new shiny Nike Air Max shoes in grade nine on the first day. Those are just parts of my story. They aren't the whole thing. And the image on the screen reminds me that we never really know the whole story. To me, this vision is bright, hopeful, and vibrant. It's the best parts of the story. It's the version we want. It's what's possible. I would say, and I'm sure many of you would say, it's what's possible when we open our hearts to a life in Jesus Christ. I remember how much I prayed for forgiveness when I did something wrong as a kid, for gratitude when I got something I wanted or needed, for strength in times of weakness. I remember being grateful for my friend, Jesus, and celebrating his presence in a multitude of ways, and always knowing when things weren't good that they would get good because Jesus would make them so. So, today I'm wearing an orange shirt. Orange is not my favorite color. It's not a color that I find particularly flattering on me, um, but it is vibrant and full of life. And I'm wearing this shirt today in recognition of Orange Shirt Day, which takes place on September 30th of each year. This year, Orange Shirt Day will be next Saturday. It's an opportunity to create meaningful discussion about the effects of residential schools and the legacy they have left behind. It's an opportunity to build bridges toward reconciliation, something our church has talked quite a bit about over the last few years. It's a day for survivors to be reaffirmed that they matter. You'll see my shirt says, every child matters. It's an opportunity for First Nations, local governments, schools, and communities to come together in the spirit of reconciliation alongside churches and built hope for generations to come. The day was inspired by Phyllis Jack Webster. On her first day of residential school in 1973, Phyllis wore her brand new orange shirt, an off to school gift from her grandmother. Phyllis, lo Phyllis loved this shirt. It was a symbol of pride and she was so excited to wear it on her first day of school, just like I was, my brand new Nike Air Max shoes, and many of you probably had something that you remember from your first day of school. But when she arrived at residential school on that first day, she was stripped of all of her belongings, including the shirt that she loved. This isn't just Phyllis's story. Between the early 1880s and 1996, over 150,000 children Indigenous children were systematically taken from their families. They were sent away to residential schools run by church organizations and funded by the Canadian government. 
In these institutions, the children were forbidden to speak their language and practice their culture. They were made to assimilate into white, European, Canadian culture, and they were forced to endure all manner of physical and emotional abuse. In recent years, we have learned about the thousands of unmarked graves on the grounds of former residential schools. We know the big story, but we don't often know the names of the children who lived through these experiences or died because of them. Children like 12-year-old Chani Wenjak. On October 16, 1966, Chani and two of his friends, they were brothers, ran away from Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School in Kenora, Ontario. They walked 31 kilometers to the brother's uncle's house where they stayed for a few days before Chani decided he would try to walk the rest of the way home to Ogoki Post, 600 kilometers away. Today it would take 15 hours, a little more than 15 hours to drive between those two locations. He walked along the main line of the Canadian National Railway, but Chani didn't make it home. He died from hunger and exposure. I remember learning about residential schools when I was a student in high school, when I had my jeans rolled up and I was running across the Humber River, when I was playing knock on nine doors, when I was doing all of those fun things. I remembered learning about these children's experiences. But in my mind, in my history class, it happened so long ago. It was something before my time, but it was very much a part of my time and our time and the legacy of those schools lives on and will live on for generations. I don't remember thinking it then, but now, knowing the stories that I know, I know that Chani's story did not end there all those years ago. Like this cityscape, we never know the whole story. I imagine for Chani, something bright, hopeful, and vibrant. His story is not just one of residential school, hunger, cold and trauma. It's one of a family he loved, longed for, and wanted to return to. It's resilience, courage, laughter, joy, and strength. I don't know who he drew on or what he drew on for those things at that time, but I believe just like me as a young person that Chani found strength in his creator. So today, our theme is trusting God amidst the challenges of life. Those kids had some challenges that, thank God, most of us will never ever know or experience. But we have other challenges, and it's important for us to hold on to God in those times. And Alan's gonna dig deep. He's gonna dig deep in a way that I could not. But I did wanna share this with you and encourage you um, next week on Saturday or on Sunday or on Friday, for those of you who are in schools, uh, wear an orange shirt and remember these stories.
sing, I'm here to meet with you. I'm here to meet with you. Come and be with you. I'm here to find you. Reveal yourself to me. Before I invite uh, Dave and Joy forward um, to mark a seasonal change in their lives, we are just beginning the autumn season, so it's a good time to make a change. But a couple of verses from Philippians that always strike me with um, the spirit that Dave has and Joy over these years of service from Philippians chapter 2. I'll just read a few verses. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And I can say honestly that uh, with Dave and Joy over these years, they've presented very much a humble, uh, loving spirit and really a joy for me to have worked with them so closely for all of these years. So I wanted to read that. I'm gonna ask then Dave and Joy to come on forward, if you don't mind. <clears throat> I did ask with them yesterday if this was allowed. <laughs> they agreed. <laughs> yes. Hey, Mon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, you know, we want to acknowledge uh, Dave enjoys 
service in our in our church family. I mean, Dave and Joy have, were here long before I ever came, and that was 30 years ago. So you guys have been here and put up with a lot. So I thank you for that. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. And they've always served with a spirit of love and joy, and um, just real love and joy. Love and joy. There you go. <laughs> And, you know, just willing to jump in and do whatever uh, was possible to help out. So, um, Muya was not here today. Muya was in Nigeria at the moment. But uh, here is a gift from the church for you guys, which uh, is from Muya's art shop, which is First Nations. And I'm going to just say what it is because it's, once you get into it, it's going to be very difficult to unwrap here. You need a knife and everything like that, right? <laughs> so anyway, a gift to you guys. Maybe you, you want to open it downstairs maybe later, but it's a, there we go. It's an original art piece uh, of an Inuvik uh, artist, and um, it's, a, it's a piece of welcome. So it stands for welcome, a symbol of welcome. And I thought with you guys, Dave, your presence here in our midst at the back for so many years, you were always a welcoming spirit. And many people have said to me, the reason why I'm here at this church is somebody at the front named Dave uh, welcomed me and greeted me right away and, and knew my name. So that's, uh, that's very cool, man. So you, you are a symbol of welcome, and this piece hopefully is a reminder of that as we go forward. I don't know if you wanted to say a word here, either of you. I just wanted to say something. Yeah, first. great. I just wanted to say I've been coming to this church since I was a young teenager. I think I was 13, 14 years old when I came here. And even though I was on my own, everyone in the church made me feel so welcome that I decided to stay. So I'm still here all these years later. So when Dave and I got married, we decided to make this church our home, and I'm so glad that we did. Well, I, was, I wasn't going to say this, but uh, somebody from Mount Dennis was up earlier, not only from Mount Dennis, from Bala School, where I went from kindergarten to grade eight, but also then from Mount Dennis Baptist. I lived across the street <coughs> from there, and uh, I moved there when I was five. And I left in uh, the late 50s and uh, snuck up to Weston because they had uh, a young, young people's group and uh, there were some girls up here. <laughs> so eventually I met Joy. I continued to be at Weston and Mount Dennis and then, but I met Joy and uh, when I started coming more regularly, I never, um, never thought that in 30 years, I would somehow be something called an associate pastor. Like that's just second place, really. <laughs> <laughs> However, it, it was great. I learned so much working with Alan and uh, enjoyed serving the people you people for that long, because I, when I was at Mount Dennis, I was involved with all kinds of things. I printed off the bulletins every week, and uh, it, was, it was totally different. And the, the thing when I came to meet Joy, I had to sneak in at night because Mount Dennis people back then were not allowed in, in Weston. There was, you, you know that. Were you? You're from Mount Dennis. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so thank you very much for this. And uh, apparently there's going to be some food today. So uh, those of you who are, more words are going to be shared later on downstairs. Th thank you. Okay. Let's just, uh, maybe we'll stand together. Let's stand as a sign of uh, respect for Dave and Joy. And let me pray for them as they uh, carry on. And they, they're still going to be with us. And I'm still going to get this guy engaged as much as I can. But uh, it won't be so formal. <laughs> there we go. Let me pray for you guys. 
Father, thank you for it, uh, your love for us. Um, we just sang that song because of your love. We do so much, Lord. Uh, thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love for us, and how you sh showered that upon us in so many ways. And again, Lord, we thank you for uh, Dave and Joy, for their presence in our midst, for their ministry, um, how they've shared in a humble way, Lord, your love and, and spirit of kindness and friendship. And so, Lord, we do pray that you will bless them, Lord, in this new season of their lives, that uh, it will be a rich time for them and um, a fun time and a, just a different time of, of um, living their days. So, Lord, be with us now and be with us after uh, the service downstairs. Uh, may we be mindful again, Lord, and hear stories of how we've appreciated the uh, presence of Dave and Joy with us. So, Lord, we give you thanks. Thank you also for their family who's with us this morning. Appreciate each one. We cont continue to pray that your blessing on, on them and their whole family and Dave and Joy, Lord. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So um, I'm just going to pray for the community. Before I begin, I'm just going to ask that you hold in your heart somebody who you think can benefit a little bit from the vibrancy, the love of Jesus this morning. So they might be someone right next to you, or they might be someone who's not at church today, um, but hold them in your heart. And immediately following the community prayer, I will pray for the offering as well. Vibrant God, your creation explodes with the colors of the rainbow. Your people reveal the beauty of diversity. You grace each of us with equal measure in your love. Let us learn to love each other more deeply so that we can create peaceful and just communities. Inspire us to use our creative energies to build the structures we need to overcome obstacles such as intolerance and indifference. Jesus has been the example we need. May we open ourselves to his love, and may the Holy Spirit warm our hearts for the journey. Amen. This morning's scripture is Psalm 84, and you can find it on page 506 of your Pew Bible. The joy of worship in the temple. To the leader, according to the Gittith of the Korahites, a psalm. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Here ends the reading of the scripture. Well, we've been blessed over the years with uh, friends from Mount Dennis. Baptist Church just down the street. Very cool. We used to do the gathering. It was a gathering it was a Saturday night praise thing we did for a number of years, once a month. And 
seems to me that Tamara made her first entrance into this great church uh, through one of our gathering experiences. And Tamara and Natalie connected, both as teachers. And here we are today, and then she's added her uh, presence and her beauty uh, with us all these years. So thanks for that. And Dave, well, what can we say? So. Good to see a few people here. Good to see a few folk who haven't seen around for a little while who are visiting with us. Good to see my old dive buddy, Brad Saunders, here. Dove the waters of San Andres together. We had a cool week. Remember that? <laughs> and Jenny, nice to see you. Very cool. A librarian. Up from Trent. Yikes. Get through Trent periodically now because they're going down to the um, county. Others who are here, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, we've been looking at various valleys, and uh, today we look at the valley of aridness or the valley of Baca. And um, it's interesting, the word Baca can mean cactus or a reference to a flower that is very dry. So it can be a symbol of aridness, physically but also spiritually. Arid times. Or it uh, can be a time of sorrow or weeping. In some of our translations, it's called the Valley of Tears. So back it can go either way. Back it can go a time of aridness, or a time of sorrow, mourning, tears. And so I know that this is a valley that we all go through at some point. We've walked in the valley of Baca. You've walked there. You've had your dry times. It can be dry times spiritually, but it might just be dry times emotionally, dry times physically. dry in terms of aspirations and hopes, just kind of a season of foulness, maybe, good sense of it, not a whole lot going on the way you want it, yeah, so this season of dryness or aridness, or of course it can be the season of pain and mourning number of you have had your experiences recently of deep mourning, valley of tears. Remember years ago, I hope you don't mind me telling stories. Is that right? Can I tell stories? It's okay. Remember when I guess I was back in uh, second year university and, uh, and I had a singing group. And one of the guys in the group, who is a very good friend of mine, now lives down east, I uh, was going through a rough time, and uh, it was going on for a while, and finally I had to ask him to leave the group. And this group had been going on for about six years, so we, we were singing all the time. And so for me to ask him to leave was a very painful experience. And I remember going to his house and telling him, and when I got home, finally, I just cried and cried, cried, just kneeled down, wept. But I had to ask this good friend of mine to leave the group. And I don't weep that easily. And so it was kind of a bit of an outpouring, I guess. But I really felt very pained about that. It was a valley of tears. He ended up going into radio, was a radio announcer out in Vancouver, did quite well. And we got together just a couple of years ago, and, and I, you know, I said, hey, Bob, because I really couldn't remember all of it, you know, it was a long time ago, saying, uh, man, you know, whatever that was about, <laughs> I, you know, maybe I shouldn't have asked you to leave the group. And he said to me, which is very nice, Alan, you exactly did the right thing, I had to leave the group. So that was kind of interesting. But I, you know, I just felt bad. I, I figured, like, man, there's got to be a different way to walk these waters than that. So, I mean, a valley of tears, and you have whatever those experiences are, right? 
the valley of aridness, valley of tears, the valley of Baca. So I know you've had the experience. So and the Brits, the Brits sometimes say, go and have a think about that. And so we're going to have a think about this little psalm right now, which is a beautiful psalm, Psalm 84. Divides into three pieces. There are three beatitudes. NRC uses the language of happy are. NIV, KJV, it's blessed. It is the word blessed. So it begins with a longing for home. And, and the image here that's really happening is in Israel, three times a year, you were to go on pilgrimage. Passover, Pentecost, Sukkot. And these were week-long pilgrimages to Jerusalem. That's what people were invited to do. In fact, they were commanded to do it. Often people couldn't get to it. How can you pull out three weeks a year to do that? So they would try to do it at least once. And then even that, after a while, they started building other holy sites throughout Israel. So if you couldn't go to Jerusalem, you could go to some of them. But people really wanted to go, whether they could or not. And so what they, what's going on here in this psalm is the psalmist is thinking and imagining one of these pilgrimages to Jerusalem, the beautiful city of Jerusalem on a hill. It is a beautiful city. It's a chance to go. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The writer is imagining one of these pilgrimages and is imagining going to this beautiful city and to the beautiful temple that Solomon had built. And it was a beautiful temple. I imagine going, ah, being in God's courts, that's, that's what's going on there. And so it's a longing in some ways for home, sometimes longing that we have for home, wherever that might be. Imagining the temple, imagining its beauty. One of the things we've been thinking about with the church and with the building next door, we'll get to that hopefully someday, is that we want it to be a beautiful place. We don't want to just build a warehouse. You can worship in a warehouse, no doubt, people do. But places of beauty are places that draw people, and they honor God. God, the temple was beautiful. Beauty is from God. Aesthetics is from God. And so to make a place and build a place that is beautiful honors God. God is present in his beauty. And so that's part of our aspiration, but it was also part of the psalmist. Solomon, when he builds it, imagines this beautiful place, and finally he constructs it. And it goes beyond just the building to from place to presence. And that, that's why, I think that's why you come to church, really, ultimately. Whether you feel it or not, at a deeper level, you're longing for more than just coming to a place. People don't keep going to church year after year just to be at a place and to be with friends. I don't think so. There's something deeper than that. And so often we do link a place with a connection with God, of coming home. And so I think in our, in our spiritual journey, if we want to go deeper, that, that's part of what it's all about, is wanting to long to, for God and to know God and experience God. It's, it's, it's not just about a, going to a place, right? So it's our longing at a deeper spot Clearly, it doesn't happen just here in a building like this or some other church, but it, that, can, that can become a touchstone. And there are other touchstones. And we need to find those that help us to sense a season of home, of being with God, knowing God. Here we are, just starting the autumn season. Interesting, I was talking to my friend in Bolivia this week, and he was saying... You, Alan, spring, so, uh, spring, spring just started because they're south of the equator. And at his church, they had a celebration on the first day of spring. They're doing a barbecue because it's spring and we're enjoying spring. So there's a real connection with the seasons. 
And so sometimes autumn can be a wonderful season. Maybe that's the season that you like best. There's a beautiful jazz song called Autumn Leaves. And the singer saying, I miss you all the time, but I miss you most, Natalie, in autumn, when the autumn leaves start to fall. So maybe the autumn is the season when we connect with God. Whatever it is, see, but we need, I think we're invited to look and find these places of home, moving from place to the presence of God. That is what I think the psalmist is wanting there. It's not just to finally get a visit to Jerusalem again, something deeper than that. And then as we note, there's all kinds of names for God in this psalm. It's all about God. It's about God and my relationship with God. So I'll focus on three, Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts, the Lord of the starry universe, the star fields, Ruth Coburn used to sing of. Looking up into the Milky Way, if you have a chance to do that. That's the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is all these amazing millions and millions of not only stars but galaxies. The Lord of hosts, and that phrase is used four times in this psalm. God is the Lord of hosts. Four times, he is the Lord of hosts. <sighs> this week I had a chance to be down in the county and looking up, and it was a super clear night, and you could see the Milky Way. You could see the dust of the Milky Way. It was just clear. <sighs> two, two spirals, the arms. It's all an expression. You can imagine being in Israel 3,000 years ago, David and others writing how clear those skies would be at night. He's a shepherd, hills of Bethlehem. The Lord of hosts. And then the third name there, the living God. God is the living God, meaning he is the God that gives life. He gives life. I read an article recently on the planet Venus, and Venus is a sister planet to, to the Earth. So why is Venus got temperatures of 450 degrees Fahrenheit on, on, the, on the surface and worse? There's absolutely no life, as far as we know, on that, that it's just like hell, that planet. But here we live on this beautiful planet, the God who gives life. Your life, my life, a gift from God. Every day you got is a gift from God. Every day that I've got is a gift from God. One day those days will end. So we give praise to God, the giver of life. The God of Jacob. Last week we talked about going through the Valley of Sukkot, and Valley of Sukkot was where Esau and Jacob were reconciled as brothers in that very place. So the God who gives us relationships and family and so on, that, that's the God of Jacob. So talking about a person, right? That God, and now he's your God and my God. It's a beautiful thing. Knowing that God. And then the psalmist says he's imagining, well, even a, even a bird, even a sparrow finds a place in the temple. He's looking, remembering, seeing the sparrow. I went outside my house just recently in Etobicoke, and, and there was a bird. And a bird had hit the glass and was stunned and, and lying on the pavement. I've seen that before, and usually they're dead. So I, I picked the bird up, thinking the bird was dead, and when I touched him, he opened his eyes. He looked right at me. But he didn't have any more strength than to do that. He just looked at me. I said, oh, hey. So then I, I picked him up, brought him around the backyard and put him down, kind of nursed him on some grass there, actually along some bushes hoping that he would perk up and fly away. Went back the next day, and he was gone. So I said, hey, maybe he's out there flying away now. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> I'm hoping some creature didn't come along and eat him up. I say, in my mind and heart, he flew away. Even the sparrow. So the sparrow here becomes a metaphor, becomes an image. 
that even as God cares for the sparrow, God cares for you, cares for me. He knows your name, knows all about you, knows all about your arid valleys, your painful ba valleys, your tearful valleys, knows about the whole thing, knows your name, my name. Wow, eight billion people on the planet, he knows our name. And we're invited to move into relationship with him. So the, the sparrow here becomes a symbol for us. Reminder that we also are God's sparrow. Remember talking to Sharon Thiessen one time? It's done all the art around here. We were talking about something, and in fact, she had, she had used the verses on some of her painting about the sparrow. God sees the sparrow when the sparrow falls. We know that verse, right? And her point was, yeah, but the sparrow still falls. It's a good point. The, spirit, the sparrow still fall, fell. Maybe didn't make it back up. Maybe it was stunned, and maybe that was it. But God knows, and he knows all these nuances and weavings, interweavings in our own lives. And so we are invited then to know him. And so it ends with that first part with blessed, happy are. Happy are those who find home in God. And it's quite true. Life is more than all of our meetings, right? Life is more than all of your meetings. All of your times, all of your times on the, on the net and social engagement and everything else, and social media, we're all on it. But life is more than that, right? What's your life really about? That's where this psalm is really finally going. Where is your home really? Your true home. So that's the first part. So there's an imagining of going and now the psalmist actually gets up and starts going. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. See all these different names used for God here. Second piece. So... It begins with a beatitude this time, verse 5. So this new unit begins with, verse 5, Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Happy are you, as blessed are you. Happy are you, happy am I, when we get up and go on this sacred way, when we make journey. And what's happening here is you have to make the journey. If you want to get to Jerusalem, finally, you've got to get up and go. You can't just think about it. We want to have a think, okay, I'm having a think, but now I want to get up and go. I've got to make it happen. You've got to make it happen. Happy are those who walk the highway to Zion. If you're going to know God in your life, you have to put in a bit of effort. That's the way it goes. It's a relationship, just like any other relationship. Walk the highways. And here we see we often find ourselves in the valley of Baca. We find ourselves in that arid place. We find it in the tearful place. The times when you're, oh, you know, you're just done, man. You're, you're just weeping. Whatever that time is for you. Maybe you've had something like that this week. I don't know. Valley of aridness, the valley of mourning, the valley of pain, the valley of hurt, the valley of sorrow. So they're walking through the valley of Baca. But when they go, they are refreshed. They are strengthened. So we note the text here, what it says. It's, it's actually a very interesting text, verse 6. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. Here it's translated, they make it a place of springs. But it means God refreshes. And one translator says, God is the rainmaker. I like that. He is the rainmaker, another name for God. He is the one who refreshes us. So they make it a place of springs is, is referring to God's reference, God's energy and rainmaking in our lives. He's the one who renews us 
so that we go from strength to strength. Verse 8. So God is our rainmaker. Think of indigenous people. I think of indigenous. 75% of the people in Bolivia are indigenous. All kinds of groups, peoples. And they're very connected to the earth. Very connected. So the church says, hey, we're going to celebrate the first day of autumn. That's, that's just not like a really normal thing for them. Because they're connected. God is the rainmaker. Many places in, in Bolivia, it's, it, there's no irrigation. It's, they're dependent on the rain. If the potatoes are going to grow, they need some rain. And they pray for rain. God is the rainmaker. We look to the rainmaker, God. But the point here is that God is the one. He makes rain. He refreshes you. He refreshes me as we stay in. Challenges is we often distance ourselves in those pains and in those valleys of Becca. We're in the valley of hurt. And then we say, I don't like to be hurting. And so I say, God, where are you? And I blame God. And then I distance myself from God. And what we're invited to do is not distance ourselves from God, but to stay with God in the valley of Baca, and he will renew us and refresh us even as we stay there. A little harder if you take off and never want to have anything to do with God again. God pursues us, a hound of heaven, but it makes it harder. We're invited to stay. Stay and move from strength to strength. Do not give up in fatigue, which is a miracle. How can you go from strength to strength? Normally, if you're strong and you really work out, finally you get weak, right? At the end, you're weak. You need the rest. The picture here is going from strength to strength to strength to strength because God is our strength. And so it's speaking of something marvelous, something graceful, something more than just your energy. You are depending on God, so you go forward in strength. It's a miracle. Otherwise, you're going to grow tired. So we move from strength to strength. We're on the way. We're making our pilgrimage. We're not distancing ourselves. We're going. We're moving. And then finally, we show up and God is there. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. So we're almost done. We're still thinking, right? Have a think. So we meet God in time and space. That's the only place you can meet God. We are humans right now. We are part of this tiara. We're part of this earth. God designs it so we meet him in his world, in our here and now. That's the only place you can meet God. You're here, you're now, your reality. In your reality, no matter how screwed up it is, that's where you are invited to meet God. That's it. There's no other place. You can be in a place you can't pay your bills, everything is just falling apart, everything is crap. Still, that's your here and now, and you are invited to know and meet God. Good times, bad times, the Valley of Baca. Previously, we looked at the valley of the shadow of death, another one. In those hurtful times, that's your here, that's your now. And then we receive these gifts. What is that, a bee or is it flying? Like a wasp, great. You know what, I hadn't been stung for the longest time. And then I was stung twice within a week, just recently. Hurts like heck when you're stung by a bee. Yikes. Hence my pause there. I don't want to be stung again. <laughs> Gifts from God. What is God giving us? Here he's called the sun. You know, it's the only time in all of the Bible that God is called sun. He is the sun. And maybe part of that was because in other faith religions, they often made a connection with the sun. The Incans certainly do. But here the writer says sun. Of course, it's a metaphor again, but what does it mean? It means God is energy. God is light. God is power. He is like the sun for you and for me. And he's also a shield. Verse 11 here. 
And the shield mainly was to help in times of fear, for protection. God is my shield in times of fear. Times of fear. There was a lockdown recently in the Junction area. School, high school. Heard about it later, LC was in school in the lockdown. So that sends out texts. Not sure if Sanjay was in that too. He's at the same school. Hmm? He, he was? Okay. Whatever. You're in school, there's a lockdown. There's going to be fear, right? That's fearful. Get a text, I'm in lockdown. I mean, it happened in our schools. This is our reality. So we go to God in our times of fear. He's the one who helps us, walks with us. So much in times of fear, you, you have to just be able to get up and move beyond that, right? You have to be able to move. Fear can paralyze us. So we can't even move. Boom. I can hardly move an arm. Fear. So where do we go in times of fear? Psalmist says, God is our shield. He's our shield. We go to him. Malachi says this, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise. It's a bit close. With healing in its wings. You should go out leaping like calves from the stall. Beautiful verse from Malachi. The prophets are filled with all these kind of nuggets of beauty. That's one of them. So it's good to read it. But beyond that, God is our grace. He's our favor. KJV translates grace. Grace from God. It's a gift. Sorry, we go back. Honor. God is, honors us with our glory, your glory. Sometimes in the Psalms, by the way, your soul will be translated as glory. The word is soul, but it will be translated glory. What is your soul? Your soul is your glory. Your soul, that you are in relationship with God forever and forever and forever, that's your glory. Not every creature has that. We have a soul from God full of glory. And then finally, goodness. We're going to sing about that. God is good to us. All of those are his gifts. And then the psalm ends with those who trust. The third one, a beatitude. In each of these three stanzas, it ends in verse 12. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. So that's giving a think to Psalm 84. So then what do we do with that? Well then, three quick points. One, we're on a pilgrimage. We are all on a pilgrimage. You are on your life pilgrimage. I am on it. So we can fill our pilgrimage with all kinds of stuff, whatever it is. Never give God a thought your whole life. One day, there will be a time when you'll think a little bit about it. On our way to be our, with in our true home, our true selves in our true home, on a pilgrimage, on a pilgrimage. People work like crazy their whole lives, and then what happens? We have a relative who works with the CIA in the United States. If you're going to work with the CIA, you have to retire at 55. It's just it. 55, you're out. Because you've got to be able to make decisions real fast. Boom, 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 boom. 55. They're afraid at 56 you won't be able to do that so quick. So at 55, man, you're just a young guy at 55, are you not? Now your whole career is gone. Now what are you going to do? Now you've got to do something new. What's your life pilgrimage about? So we're all on a journey. We need to give it some thought. What are we doing with our journey? And our pilgrimage will take us through the Valley of Baca. It will, no doubt. Sooner or later, you're going to be in that. I'm going to be in it. Aridness or pain or sorrow, and unfortunately, we're often in those places. But, thirdly, God is our rainmaker. He's our sun. He will refresh us. 
He will energize us, but you and I are invited to stay close to him and just make that a little bit easier. God will refresh us. God will renew us. Don't give up on it. He's there for you. He's there for me. Our true home. It just makes sense, does it not? If he's the creator, we're the creature, it just makes sense. Our home. So the psalmist is trying to encourage our hearts. May we say yes, may we receive the words, may we be encouraged in Christ's name. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of the work that Dave and Joy have put into this church over their time here. Today, as we go down to celebrate, help us to bring laughter and joy and strength and power to our stories about Dave and Joy's time, and help us to enjoy the delicious food that has been prepared for us, and bless the hands that have made it, and those who have donated to make it all happen. We love you, Lord. Help us to go out into this week believing that you are with us through all of our troubles and all of our trials, no matter what. Amen. <laughs>